Good morning, all my students. Welcome back to uh, our class now. Okay, so this is the second part of the lecture this morning. Remember, uh, we have just had a short break for about 10 minutes. Okay, so I hope that uh, after the break, you all become the fresh and uh, will be well able to follow my, rec my lecture with a uh, very strong concentration. Okay, so the before the break, we have seen the legal consequences of a voidable juristic act. Remember, when a juristic act is voidable and is subsequently avoided, uh, then it carries some legal consequences. We have seen that a general consequence is that okay, once it is avoided, it will be void of initial right. Uh, before its avoidance, then it remains valid. Okay, the, the general consequence is that before it is avoided, it remains valid. Okay, so the, when it is avoided, then the, there will be uh, consequences as follows. The first one is that uh, it is retrospective nullity. Even though before avoidance, it remains valid. When it is avoided by the present law by law, it will be deemed by law as void of initio, so that means that it is the retrospective nullity. And the second consequence is that uh, all parties will be restored to their original positions, so that this is the the restitution, the restitution effect. Okay, so we have seen that. Okay, with re with respect to the restitution. Uh, we have section 176, okay, which say that the parties shall be restored to original positions, okay, and in the case where it is impossible for the restitution, then the, the parties who has received the property will have to do what? Will have to uh, pay damages in compensation for the return of the property, okay, which becomes impossible. Okay, that is what we have seen uh, from the first part of the lecture and we in fact have look at you know the consequences with respect to the fruits of the property which is required by law to be returned okay in the case where a contract between let's suppose that a and b is voidable and is subsequently avoided by the party allowed by law okay then the the juristic act in question, in this case a contract, will become the void, okay? Uh, once it's, it is avoided, it is deemed to have been void uh, of initio, okay? So the question arises as to whether or not uh, when the law directs restitution, whether or not the person who is required by law to return the property is also required by law to return the fruits, okay? Which accrue on the property required by law to be returned, okay, and we have seen that in this case, uh, section 1376 uh, in conjunction with section uh, 415 uh, leads to the consequence that if a person who is returned, uh, who is required by law to return the property, okay, if that person remains in good faith, then the, that person uh, is entitled by law to hold the fruits okay the accruing on that property without having to return the fruits accruing on such property as well okay so that is uh, we well, that is what we have seen the, uh, before the break okay the, now we are coming to the second part of the lecture we will talk about the periods of prescription for the exercise of the rights in, in relation to uh, uh, a voidable act, okay? Remember, okay, the, even though when a juristic act is voidable, okay, the, and uh, a person may have the right to do what? A person may have the right to avoid that voidable juristic act. But in the, in the, the case where that person uh, intends to exercise the right to do what? Exercise the right to avoid that juristic act, it does not mean that I mean, he can do so at any time he would like. Okay, the, because in this case, on this point, the law prescribes some periods of prescription for the purpose of ex exercising the right or the right to avoid the jurisdiction in question. Okay, in addition to 
prescribing the periods of prescription for exercising the right to avoid a jurisdiction act which is voidable. The law also prescribes okay, a period of prescription for claiming restitution. Okay, so there are two rights, two rights concerned. Okay, two rights in relation to a voidable act. Okay, the first right is the right to avoid a jurisdiction act. The right to avoid the jurisdiction act which is voidable. The second one, it is the right to claim restitution. Okay, uh, in the case of a what about Joseph Act? Okay. In these two cases, in the case of exercising the right to avoid okay, the, the Joseph Act, or in the case of you know, claiming restitution, the law prescribes the periods of prescription. Okay. Let's have a look at the period of prescription okay, required by law uh, for the purpose of avoiding okay, the Joseph Act, which is voidable. Okay. In this case, the law prescribes a period of prescription for avoidance. Okay, then this is embodied in section 181. 181, section 181 provides as follows. Okay, the 181. Uh, a voidable act is incapable of avoidance upon the lapse of one year as from the time at which Ratification could have been met, okay, or upon the lapse of 10 years, as from the conclusion of such voidable Jurisdic Act. Okay, so there are two periods. The second one, okay, 10 years as from the conclusion of such voidable Jurisdic Act. That is the maximum period of prescription, okay, no matter what. Nobody can just exercise the right to avoid the voidable Jurisdic Act after 10 years. After 10 years as from the conclusion of such voidable Jurisdic Act. Let's support that we have a contract which becomes voidable on the ground of a mistake as to the quality of the property, okay? The contract is made between A and B and this contract becomes voidable on the ground of a mistake as to the quality of the property. Let's support that A wants to avoid this contract. In this case, let's support that a period of 10 years has elapsed. Okay, as from the conclusion of such contract, in that case, nobody is allowed by law to avoid the Jersey Act anymore. Nobody is allowed by law to avoid this contract anymore because, okay, a period of 10 years has elapsed since its conclusion, okay, since the conclusion of that contract, okay, so the period of 10 years, it is the maximum period of prescription, okay. But the thing is that, okay, if the period of 10 years has not elapsed, we are still, okay, we are still bound by the period of prescription, okay, the required by section 181, okay, that is the period of one year as from the time at which ratification could have been made. Okay, again, let's support that we have a contract between A and B. The law says that if the contract becomes voidable, if any party wants to avoid this contract, then that person will have to avoid it, okay, within the period of one year as from the time at which ratification could have been made. The question is, what is the time of, what is the time, of, what is the time for ratification, okay, of the Chosen Act? If we want to ratify it, then we should do so. We have to do so, okay, the within what period of time, okay? If we look at what the law say with respect to ratification, okay, Section 179 sets the period of time, okay, in fact, I mean, that set the, 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 the uh, sorry, the period of prescription, okay, for ratification, okay, according to Section 179, okay, 179 say that, well, the, we, we're going to have a look at, you know, 179 here, okay, oh, 
The, the thing is that 181 referred to the time at which registration could have been made. So when we, when we have to apply section 181, we will have to apply it in conjunction with the, the, you know, the provision of law regarding registration, okay? The provision of law regarding registration, it is section 179. 179 sets the period of prescription for what? For registration. It says that, okay, in fact, I mean, the 179 say, okay, the registration cannot be made after the cessation of the factor trickling voidability. Okay, registration can be made after cessation of the factor trickling voidability. In fact, I mean, the just now, I, I just mean to uh, make a mention of the period of prescription for restriction, okay? But it, in fact, it is not the period of prescription. It is a period of time, okay? I made a mistake just now in the, uh, saying I mean, something as, I mean, period of prescription for restriction. In fact, when second 179, okay, prescribes, okay, the, the, the time for restriction, that is the period of time, okay? The period of time for restriction, it is after the cessation of the factor trickling voidability. Let's suppose that we have a contract between A and B which is voidable on the ground of the, let's say on the ground of jurors. Okay, so, so section 179 says that if one party is supported A, the contract is made between A and B and it is, it is, and it is made under jurors so that this contract becomes voidable Okay, if A, let's say that A is a seller, B is a buyer, if A just wants to ratify this contract, the law uh, in section 179 of the civil and Commission Court say that the A will have to ratify it after the cessation of the, fact, the factor trickling voidability. What is a factor which triggers voidability in this case? This contract is void, sorry, is voidable on the ground of jurors, the threat, remember. So the fact the factor which triggers voidability it is the threat. So when A and B has made this contract under jurors, i.e. I mean the, as the result of a threat ex exerted by B and A is want to ratify this contract, A will have to do so after the cessation of the factor which triggers this voidability, the factor which triggers this voidability, it is the threat. So when A is no longer, okay, when A is no longer under threat, that means that the factors which triggers this voidability just ceases to exist as soon as as soon as A is no longer under threat. Okay, when there is no more threats between A and B, in this case, A at that point, from that point of time, A can just ratify this contract because, okay, because what? Because the factor which trigger voidability just ceases to exist. The law say that ratification can be made after the cessation of the factor trickling voidability. So in this case, given that this contract is voidable on the ground of duress, namely a threat, okay, so that A, the seller, is, okay, no longer, as soon as A is no longer under threat, okay, so that uh, since then, okay, the, the factor which triggers voidability just cease to exist so that A from then on is in the position to ratify this contract. So when we just apply you know, the provision of section 181, we will have to consider section 181 in conjunction with section 179 because 181 Okay, which prescribes the period of prescription for the exercise of the right to uh, to avoid uh, the jurisdiction act. Okay, provide that avoidance will have to be made what within one year as from the time at which ratification could have been made. Given that section one seven nine says that 
rectification can be made as soon as you know that the factor which triggers vulnerability ceases to exist. So when we apply 181, we can just come to the conclusion that okay, we can just avoid the juicy gap. Okay, within one year as from the cessation of the factor trickling voidability. So you have to just look at this very carefully. Again, okay, the section 181 says that we can just avoid the juicy gap, which is voidable. Okay, one year, okay, within one year as from the time at which ratification could have been made. When section 179 says that ratification can be made after the cessation of the factor trickling vulnerability, we can just conclude that if we want to avoid the juicy gap, which becomes voidable, sorry, if we yes, if we want to avoid a juicy gap which is voidable, we will have to do so within one year as from the cessation of the factor trickling vulnerability. Okay, so the, we are going to have the example here. Let's suppose that we have a contract between A and B. Okay, the, so B in this case has purchased this painting from A. A does tell a lie to B that this painting has been by a very Nationwide, sorry, nationwide famous artist, Master Chilun Chai. In fact, that was a lie, okay, because the truth is that this painting has not been by Master Chilun Chai at all. It has been, you know, the, the work of I mean, an infamous artist, okay, so that in this case, when A gave B a false statement, for inducing B to buy this painting and B believe in the lie told by A and in reliance on this misstatement B bought this painting from A we have seen that this is the case of what? that is the case of fraud remember the, the statement which has been given to uh, which has been given from one party to the other party in a deceitful manner in order to induce the other party to enter into a choosing act with the first party. So in this case, this contract is voidable on the ground of what? On the ground of fraud. If A, sorry, not A, B, okay, because B here, the buyer, does not want to buy this painting. Okay, the contract has been made between A and B, and now B has been aware of the truth that the painting was not by Master Chilum Shai. So B now wants to you know, escape the contractual obligation, okay? B does not want to take this penny anymore, okay? So B wants to avoid this contract. So the law say again that if B wants to avoid this contract, B will have to do so one year as from the time at which ratification could have been made. Okay, and the law also said that registration could be made after the cessation of the factor which trigger vulnerability so that we can just conclude that okay, if we want to avoid a juicy gap, we will have to do so one year as from the cessation of the factor trickling vulnerability. In this case, what is a factor which trigger vulnerability? The factor which trigger vulnerability is what? It is the deceitful statement, the lie told by A, the fraud, of course. Okay, so let's suppose that this contract was made on the 8th of July 2020. Okay, so when B knew the truth, B knew the truth. Let's suppose that just a few hours after, just a few hours, okay, after the contract after the conclusion of the contract, okay, so that B knew the truth also on the 8th of July 2020. Given that the factor, the factor which triggers vulnerability in this case, it is the, it is a fraud or the deceitful statement. 
Okay, so the fraud in this case just ceased to exist on just the 8th of July 2020 because B knew the truth on the same date. B knew the truth on the 8th of July 2020 so that the factor was triggered vulnerability just okay when okay on the 8th of July 2020 so that the factor which trigger vulnerability just occur on the 8th July 2020 and it also ceased to exist on the same date because B knew the truth on the same date. Right, so the factor which triggered vulnerability just ceased to exist on the 8th of July 2020 when the law said that if a person, okay, if the person which is allowed by law wants to avoid this to get that person will have to do so one year as from the cessation of the factor which trigger vulnerability we can see that if b wants to avoid this contract between a and b b will have to do so okay one year as from the cessation of the factor which trigger vulnerability given that the factor which trigger vulnerability in this case it is the lie told by A. This factor which trigger vulnerability just ceased to exist on the 8th of July 2020. So that if B wants to avoid this contract, B will have to do so one year as from what? As from the 8th of July 2020 which is the date, date of the cessation of the what? Cessation of the factor trickling voidability. Okay, so if you are the person allowed by law to avoid the juristic in question, okay? If you want to avoid the juristic in question, okay? You will have to be mindful of the period of prescription, okay? For avoiding the juristic act, okay? The police do not Okay, do so after the period of prescription expires, otherwise you will run into big trouble. Okay, so now we are moving on to the, you know, the, the period of prescription for claiming restitution. Remember, when a juristic act, when a juristic act becomes voidable, okay, so the, when it is avoided, one of the consequences is the restitution, okay? The parties, if you are, uh, you know, if you uh, consider section 176 paragraph uh, 176 again, okay? Uh, remember, we have seen the section one, uh, we have seen 176 paragraph 1 with respect to restitution. Okay? I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting you back to 176 paragraph 1, okay? According to 170 paragraph 1, upon avoidance, then the party shall be restored to original positions. But if the, the restitution is impossible, then the law say that, okay, the, the party shall instead be entitled to damages in compensation therefore. So this is the restitution, okay, restitution effect. If any party uh, wants to exercise the right to claim restitution. It does not mean that that person can just exercise the right, okay, to claim restitution to within any time he wants. In this case, the law also prescribes a period of prescription, okay, for the purpose of claiming restitution, okay. This period of prescription is embodied in section 176 paragraph 3 which uh, sets the period of prescription for this purpose at one year from the date of avoidance okay look at what is said in the 176 paragraph 3 a claim resulting from the res restoration to original positions okay a claim resulting from the restoration to original positions under paragraph 1 may not be exercised upon the lapse of 
one year as from the date of avoidance of a voidable act. Okay, so the period of prescription, the period of prescription for claiming restriction is one year as from the date of avoidance of a voidable act. Okay, so once any party avoids the jurisdiction in question, if that person if that person wants to claim restitution, okay, when a jurisdiction act between the two parties is avoided by any party, okay, if any any party wants to claim restitution, that party will have to do so one year as from the date of avoidance. Okay, so once the jurisdiction in question is avoided, the right to claim restitution will have to be exercised within one year okay, from avoidance. That means that, okay, that does mean that if that jurisdiction act has not yet been avoided, the claim, the claim of restitution, okay, the claim of restitution is not yet barred by the period of prescription, okay? Because the law said that the period of prescription for exercising the right to claim restitution is one year from the date of avoidance. So, if that jurisdiction act is not yet avoided, that means that the period of prescription does not commence yet. It will never expire because it has not yet commenced until okay until that jurisdiction act is avoided. Okay. So again, be mindful of the period of prescription, okay, for the purpose of uh, claiming restitution, okay. Again, the law prescribes the periods of prescription for, first, the right to avoid the jurisdiction act. And secondly, the right to claim restitution, okay, in the case of avoidance, right. Now, we are going to have a look at the protection of third parties' right. Protection of the rights of third persons, okay? Okay, we have seen that when a jurisdiction act between the two parties, okay, when it is, when the jurisdiction act becomes voidable and it is subsequently avoided, right? They may be the restitution, okay? So the one thing which we have seen is that sometimes restitution cannot be met. Some term restrictions may be impossible because the property in question, okay, the property which has been the required, the property which has been received and which is required by law to be returned, okay, it is now in the hands of a third party or third person, okay, and in some cases, a third party enjoys the protection by law. Okay, so in this case, if the property is in the hands of a third party and the third party is protected by law, in such case, there might not be restriction, okay? The, the property which, has, which is now in the hands of a third party is not required by law to be returned simply because the third party is protected by law, okay? So now we will look at the protection of the third party's rights, okay, in the fuller detail, okay, so we have seen already that, okay, uh, the law also protects the rights of the third person against restitution in the case of a voidable act, okay. We will have to split this into two cases. The first one is you know, the first one, uh, it is, you know, it is, uh, it is, uh, the, it is all other cases. The second one, it is the case which involves fraud, okay? Cases in general and cases which involve fraud. In these two classes of case, these two classes, the law, okay, the, the law efforts, Protection to the third, the th uh, a third person, okay, differently, okay. 
in the case of in the case in all cases except the case of fraud what the law say is this what the law say is that okay the law protects a third person when a third person first has received the property for venture and secondly when the third person acts in good faith okay so the uh, we have the situation the, we have the situation in, in which a jurisdiction act has been made between a and b okay a jurisdiction act has been made between a and b and this jurisdiction act is voidable for some reason uh, let's say for example for the reason of what for example on the ground of jurors or on the ground of a mistake as to the quality of the property so that in this case let's suppose that this is a contract of sale of a car from a to b and this contract is voidable on the ground of a mistake as to the quality of this car so that when this contract between a and b is voidable let's suppose that a avoid this contract once this contract is avoided by a it is deemed by law to have been void from the beginning remember and this is a good statement okay in second one seven one seven six paragraph one okay now one seven six paragraph one also say that when it is avoided when the juristic in question is avoided it is deemed to have been void from the beginning and the parties shall be restored to their original position in this case if the car has been delivered by a okay to b in this case b will have to will have to do what b will have to just return this car because second 170 paragraph one directs restriction okay by saying that the parties are restored to their original position so that in this case a the seller will have to be restored to the seller's position by having this car back but whatever if before avoidance by a b sold this car to c in this case the law has also some concern for a third person okay a third person a person who is not a party to the jurisdiction between a and b okay in this case what the law say is what what the law says is contained in section 1329 1329 will protect a third person when a third person has received the property for venture and when the third person has acted in good faith okay back to 1329 and have a look at what is said in 1329 okay section 1329 provides as follows a right of a person who has acquired property for value and in good faith is not prejudiced on the the trans on the the transfer of the property has acquired the same the same here referred to the property okay the, the property under avoidable juristic act and such juristic act is thereafter avoided okay the, the meaning of taking one three two nine is this if we just get if we are back to this picture okay we have a contract between a and b here and this contract becomes voidable on the ground of let's say on the ground of the mistake as to the quality of this car so that once a knew the truth about the true quality about the you know the true quality of this car a avoids this contract when a is the seller okay avoid this contract this contract will be deemed to have been void from the beginning and the parties shall be restored to their 
or reach position so that when B has received this call from A, B is required by law, B is required by section 176 paragraph 1 to return this call to A. But the thing is that the call is no longer with B because before A is awarded this contract, B had sold this call to C. In this case, C is a third person, okay? And section 1329 say that, okay, if a third person, okay, has received the property for wedge you and in good faith, then the third party's right will not be prejudiced under the transfer rule, okay, under B who transfer this card to, to the third person here, the third person here is C, okay, under B at the transfer rule, transfer this card to C, okay, under B, transfer this card to C, okay, the, after the contract between A and B had been awarded, even though, you know, even though B, the transfer rule, okay, had received this call from A under the contract between A and B, which became voidable and which was subsequently avoided by A. The avoidance of this contract by A, okay, would not prejudice the right enjoyed by C as the third party, okay. This is what is the meaning of, you know, the of section 1329. 1329 again. 1329 protects a third person when the third person acquired the property for venue and in good faith, okay? So, in this case, if C has received this property for venue, let's suppose that B has sold this car to C. So in this case, C had received this property from B for venue because C would have to pay the price to B. Okay, and C knew nothing about, you know, the contract between A and B. C did not know anything that, C did not know that in fact, B had acquired this car under the contract between A and B, which became voidable and which was avoided. If C knew nothing about this, if C knew nothing about, you know, the state of, the state of affairs, okay, with respect to the contract between A and B here, C acted in good faith. So when C has received the property for venue and C acted in good faith, the law just, okay, give C legal protection, okay, by what? By saying that, okay, the avoidance of the act will not prejudice the rights of the third party who has received the property for venue and, okay, in good faith. Okay, so the, if we have this situation, okay, situation where uh, A sold the car to B, Okay, under the mistake as to the quality of the property. And then uh, after that, uh, A avoided this contract. But before avoidance, B had sold, you know, the car to C. In this case, if C knew nothing about what was going on between the contract, I mean, uh, what was going on under the contract between A and B. In this case, when C had received the property for wedge and in good faith, the law protects C, okay, the, so that there is no restitution, okay, the car does not need to be returned to A, uh, right, in this case, I mean, the, the law just protects the third, the third person, okay, so when the car is not required by law to be returned to A, what is going to be liability on the part of B? It is the case in which, what, it is the case in which the restitution become impossible, so in this case, B will have to just pay damages to A in compensation, okay, according to section 176, paragraph 1. Okay, remember, if we get back to 176, paragraph 1, okay, 176, paragraph 1 says that, okay, get, getting, back, getting back to this provision again, okay, if, if it is impossible to effect 
such restriction, the parties shall instead be entitled to damages in compensation therefore. Okay, so the back to the picture here. Okay, in the case where uh, before avoidance of the contract by A, B, the one who, you know, that has received this call from A, B, uh, before avoidance of this contract by A, B had sold this car to C when C okay, knew nothing about what was going on under the contract between A and B. In this case, C has received this car for graduate and in whose face so that the law protects C, uh, right, so that there is no restitution anymore. Okay, In this case, restitution of this restitution is impossible so that B will have to pay damages to A instead. Right, I mean, the, it is uh, not possible for A okay, to demand C to return the car to A, but A will have to have recourse against B. Okay, the A will have to uh, demand B to just pay damages in compensation for the impossibility of the restitution okay, according to section 176 paragraph 1 okay now just now we talk about you know the, the protection of the third parties in general cases what about in the case which involves fraud in the case which involves fraud the law will give I mean, even greater protection okay but before going to that let's get back to you know the cases in general okay let's have a look at one more example okay this example has been uh, seen by all students already okay in uh, in the class which uh, deal with what which deal with mean the a uh, which deal with the cause causes of invalidity okay the, when we have when we have considered jurists okay right Let's suppose that we have the we have this situation. We have the contract between A and B, and this is a contract of a sale of a house. Okay, the, let's suppose that you know the B B just exerted a threat on A, forcing A to just sell this house to B, okay, at a low price. In fact, you know, A did not want to sell this house to B, but the reason why A, in the end, okay, sold this house to B is because A, A was in fear. Okay, B just threatened to A that if A did not want to sell this house to B, then A would do what? A just would do what? A would just kidnap a son. Okay, the A would just kidnap. A would kidnap a uh, sorry B would kidnap a son in the you know the, in a few hours. So this this seems to be you know the danger which 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 is imminent. So that we have seen that this constitutes jurists in Thai law. When A made this contract for you know the sale of this house to B under jurists. This contract between A and B would have to be voidable, so that in this case, okay, the, in this case, if A avoided this contract, that means that this contract, the sale of this house, would be deemed by law to have been void from the beginning, and the parties, both parties, will have to be restored to their original positions according to. The law, remember. Supposing that before A avoided this contract, B subsequently, B subsequently sold this house to C, and C did not know anything about you know what was going on under the contract between A and B. B sold this house to C, who knew nothing about the contract between A and B. In this case, C, C is a what? C is a third person. C acquired this house for venture because C would have to pay the price to B. And C acted in good faith because C 
did not, uh, he did not become aware of anything about, you know, the contract between A and B. So in this case, the law protects C, there is no restitution, okay? C is not required by law to return this house to A, right? Because C has the protection, okay, under section 1329, okay? Under 1329 here, the which protects a third party's rights who has received the property for venue and in good space. All right? Yeah. Right. So in this case, when the, you know, the, when the A cannot get this house back, A will have to have recourse against B because in the case where restitution becomes impossible, in this case, B will have to pay damages to A in, compensa in compensation for the, the impossibility of restitution, okay? Now, what about the case which involves fraud? In the case which involves fraud, the law protects a third party, even, you know, even the more than cases in general. Remember, in cases in general, the law protects the third party only when the third party has received property for wedgie and in good faith. With respect to, okay, with respect to the case which involves fraud, the law protects the third party even better than cases in general because section 160 provides as follows. Section 160 provides that avoidable, sorry, avoidance of a avoidable act on account of fraud. See, on account of fraud, okay, under section 159, cannot be set up against a third person acting in good faith. So the only requirement, okay, for gaining protection by law, the only requirement for a third person to gain protection by law is that that third person acts in good faith. Irrespective of, okay, irrespective of what? Irrespective of whether or not Okay, that person has received property for venue. Okay, so let's have a look at this picture. In the case where we have a juridic act between two parties, which is voidable on the ground of fraud. Okay, in this case, the law protects a third party when the third party acts in good faith only. Okay, the, we are going to consider whether or not the, the third party has received the property for venue. Whether or not the third party received the property for venue, that is not, that is, that does not matter, that is not material. Okay, let, let's have a look at, you know, the, this scenario here, okay. We have a contract between A and B again, and let's support that this is a contract of what? This is a contract of sale, okay? A sold this car to B under this contract, and the, the reason why A sold this car to B is because A, okay, did not know about some quality of this car, okay? The, so when, in fact, A knew the truth, that in fact this car, you know, possessed some uh, qualities, uh, which is very important, okay? So, the, in fact, this car uh, possesses some qual quality which are very, very important. Okay, if A had known the truth about this quality, A would not have, A would not have sold this car to be at all, so that the mistake in question, it is the mistake as to the qual quality of this car, Right. So when it is a mistake as to the quality of this car, okay, the mistake as to the quality of the property, which is essential, which is essential. Right. In this case, the contract between A and B here becomes what? Becomes voidable. When it becomes voidable, 
Right, let's suppose that A wants to avoid this contract. When A avoids this contract, B, the buyer, will have to return this card to A. But, okay, sorry, sorry, I, I made a mistake, okay. Uh, this is, we, we are not talking about, if we are not talking about, you know, the case of fraud. Just now, you know, if the example which I have given you, I said that, you know, the, the contract was made by mistake. Now, change the fact. Change the fact into something relating to fraud. Forget about what I have said a while ago, okay? Let's get back to this contract between A and B. Let's support that. A, okay, the A sold this card to B because of the fraud committed by B. B told some lie to A about the car, okay, if A, you know, if A had not the truth, A would not have sold this car to be at all, so that the contract between A and B here was made by what? Was made, was made on account of fraud. The contract was made on account of fraud, so that this contract became voidable. If A awarded this contract, when A awarded this contract, this contract would be deemed by law to have been void from the beginning, and then the parties to this contract would have to be restored to their original position under Section 176, remember? In this case, B, the buyer, would have to return this card to A. But the thing is that before avoidance by A, B, okay, B had given this card to C. Before avoidance by A, okay, B had given this card to C. You can see that the procession between B and C is the gift. In this case, okay, in this case, C has received this card from B. Okay, the B, sorry, again, C has received this car from B, not for venture, because B just gave this car to C. B did not sell this car to C, but B just gave this car to C. So C, the third party, has received this property, not for venture, but C knew nothing about what's going on under the contract between A and B, so that C, in this case, acted in good faith. In the case of fraud, okay, even the contract between A and B was voidable on the ground of fraud, and A avoided this contract, okay, in this case, the law protects C. So that when C does acquire this property in good faith, even though not for venue, okay, in this case C enjoys the protection by law, C is not required by law to return this card to A. So that when it is impossible to effect restitution, okay, by B, B will have to pay damages to A in compensation, okay, according to section 176, remember, right? So, we can see that in the case of fraud, the law just protects a third party even better than cases in general because in other cases, the law protects a third party only when the third party has received property for venue and when the third party acts in good faith, but in the case of fraud, section, section 160 protects the right of the third party only when the third party has received pro the property in good faith, irrespective of whether or not the third party has acquired that property for venue, whether the, the third party has, I mean, the, has paid something to to the mandate transfer rule that is not material, the third party only has to act in good faith in order to gain protection by law. So in this case,
back to the facts. In this case, A sold this car to B, okay, because of a fraud committed by B, so that the contract between A and B becomes voidable, and A later avoids this contract. So that this contract becomes what? When A avoids this contract, the contract is deemed by law to have been void from the beginning, and both parties will have to be restored to their original positions. In this case, B is required by law to return the card to A. But the thing is that before the avoidance, B has given this card to C. In this case, Section 160 protects C as the third party because C acts in good faith. When C acts in good faith, Section 160 okay, say that the avoidance of the Jewish Act cannot be set up against a third person acting in good faith. Okay, so the, in this case, okay, uh, the law just uh, give protection to C even better than cases in general. If it is a case of fraud, the law protects a third party better than cases in general. Okay, have a look at one more example here. Let's suppose that we have, again, the contract between A and B. It is a sale of, it is a sale of the porcelain here, okay? So, the, let's suppose that A sold, okay, A just sold this porcelain to B because B, as the, the you know, the, as the, the archaeologist told a lie to A that this porcelain, it is the porcelain of the Right, the records in period. In fact, this you know porcelain it is the one in the so-called period. If A had known the truth that this porcelain is of the so-called so period, A would not have sold this to be at all because it is too it is very very valuable, right? The thing is that B told a lie to A about the edge of this porcelain, and A. So this, you know, that this item to be in reliance on the statement given by B, the false statement. We have seen that this is the case of what? We have learned that, okay, that the, the statement like this, it is the what? It is the fraud, the misstatement, which renders a jurisdiction jurisdic to be what? To be voidable. So that a contract which, is, which has been made between A and B here, becomes voidable. Let's suppose that A, no, okay, avoid this contract. But before the avoidance, B does give this property to C. Okay, we can see that before avoidance by A, B, the buyer, does give this property to C. In this case, C did not have to pay anything to B. C received this property. Okay, then not for venue because C received it under the gift, not the sale. But C did not know anything about the contract between A and B. C did not know that, in fact, the contract between A and B was voidable and has later been avoided by A. Okay, so that in fact B had no right to get to give this I mean the property to C. C did not know anything about this. So in this case, C has received this property not for venue but in good faith because C did not know anything about you know the contract between A and B. In this case, the law, according to Second One Sixty. Okay, according to Section 160, the law protects C because C acted in good faith. Okay, the, so in this case, C does not need to return the property to A when the restitution by B is impossible. B is required to pay damages to A in compensation, okay, according to Section 176. Paragraph 1, remember. Okay, now, okay, the, we are coming to the last part of the lecture. When we talk about, you know, the voidability, 
when we talk about the situation in which a jurisdiction becomes voidable and is capable of avoidance, we now come to the question as to who are entitled by law to avoid the jurisdiction which is voidable. It does not mean that when we have a jurisdiction between A and B, and that jurisdiction becomes voidable, it does not mean that any person can just avoid the jurisdiction. The law just, okay, the law specifies particular persons who are entitled by law to avoid the jurisdiction in question, okay. We will see the persons who are entitled by law to avoid a voidable jurisdiction. Okay, so the, this requires about an hour, okay, to just uh, discuss, right? So I think that we are going to have a second break, okay, and then uh, after the, the, this break, we are coming back to look at this issue, okay? So now, shall we have a break for about five minutes, and then we will be back to class, okay? Uh, thank you very much for attention, and see you very, very soon, okay? Don't go away.